hello fellow followers of Christ and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce and this is the Authority. Hello and welcome to The Authority, where this week we'll be discussing one of the greatest of all English authors, sometimes called the father of English poetry or even the father of English literature, uh, Geoffrey Chaucer. So Geoffrey Chaucer was lived in the 14th century, so born sometime in the 1340s and dies in 14. Hundred. So, writing in the late 1300s, uh, he's a contemporary with with the poet who wrote *The Green the Green Knight*, who was our focus in the last episode. And uh, just to remind ourselves, we did a bit of comparison between whoever the anonymous poet who wrote *The Green the Green Knight* is uh, and Chaucer last week. But to remind ourselves, Chaucer, unlike the well, *The Green Poet*, *The Green*, *The, the Green and the Green Knight* poet uh living out in the west midlands of england you know it, 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 where cities like birmingham are now uh chaucer was in london chaucer was at the heart of the politics and and the court so he was a courtier he was a diplomat he was a member of parliament um so he he, he moved in the highest circles the highest echelons of society he was revered in his own lifetime he was famous in his own lifetime and he was the first poet to be installed at poet's corner in westminster abbey um so you know if you go to london uh, as a tourist you will um uh you visit uh westminster abbey you'll, you'll go to poet's corner where many of the most famous poets in the english language are buried where well, he was the first so you know he's called the father of the english language the father of english poetry the father of english literature so perhaps it's appropriate he should be the first person to be buried in uh, Poets' Corner. And when he was buried in Poets' Corner, Westminster Abbey was an abbey. Uh, Benedictine Abbey had been there for many years, uh, centuries at that time, uh, and was destroyed by Henry VIII, that, which was uh, over a century after Chaucer's time. So this is the, the, this is the century of Merry England, of Catholic England. This is the, the, the cultural backdrop to Chaucer's uh, life. Now, why is he sometimes called the father of the English language or the father of English poetry? Well, it wasn't until the, the late 1300s that the, uh, the, the lords, the ladies, the nobility, the aristocracy, uh, parliament uh, began using English as the official language. It was always French prior to that. So the language of the aristocracy was French. The language of the university was Latin, uh, of, of, of the academics. The language of the ordinary people was English. Um, and the first opening of parliament in English as opposed to French wasn't until Chaucer's lifetime. So what Chaucer does, he chooses to write in the vernacular. So he's not first of all writing in Latin. Dante, by the way, does the same thing. Uh, he also chooses not to write in Latin, uh, which was really the language of literature up until that time. He chooses to write in the vernacular Italian. Um, and Chaucer, uh, following Dante's lead, and we, and we know that Chaucer admired Dante. There's actually a quote by, Dorsa, uh, by Chaucer about Dante where he treats him as he should with the highest praise um so chaucer chooses to write in english but but chaucer's english is different from the old english uh even the english that his contemporary the Seguin and the green knight poet is writing because it's now a fusion of two languages the old english which is germanic is now fused with the french which is latin uh, in its roots and one of the reasons for the richness of the english language is the fact it's really two languages that come together so we, there's uh, uh, the word choice has obviously increased and just uh, we can say freedom you know from the germanic freiheit the german for freedom or we can say liberty as in liberté in french so we have that choice well chaucer was the person who first if you like popularized this english which was a fusion of uh, of the of, of the French and Germanic aspects of the language. Um, he's best known for, although he wrote other works, he's best known for the Canterbury Tales, and that's what we're going to focus on uh, in, in in this episode. 
Now, it's an unfinished work. Now, normally, if a work's unfinished, you think, well, it's also, in that case, not that good, perhaps, right? Because it's not finished. Except that in this case, um, the, the, the different tales are finished, one can presume. Well, at least some of them are. And these tales stand alone as finished works. So the, the fragments of the unfinished whole are nonetheless full complete fragments in themselves so some of these uh, uh, tales are finished works of art so it, it's not spoiled even though uh i keep using the metaphor of the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle well these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle never existed <laughs> because uh chaucer died before he could finish the candy Towers, which was a hugely um ambitious work anyway uh but what's left is nonetheless one of the greatest works in the english language uh i'm going to read um what I wrote about Chaucer in my book, Literature, What Every Catholic Should Know, because sometimes I think I've said it the best I can already, and why should I garble something which I've expressed lucidly elsewhere? So uh, this is talking about the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales. So just very, very briefly, the idea of the Canterbury Tales is a group of pilgrims on their way from London. They meet up at a pub called the Tabard Inn in Southwark, just south of the River Thames, not far from where later Shakespeare's Globe Theatre would be uh, and they are going to go on pilgrimage to Canterbury and Canterbury of course is um, where the martyr Thomas Beckett uh, that's where his shrine and tomb is that's where he was murdered uh, a few a uh, hundred or more years before this um, and uh, what they decide to do is they're going to tell each other stories on the way there and on the way back. So you have this assembly of characters, most of whom are pretty miserable sinners with a couple of saints thrown in. And that's what I'm talking about here. So in the general prologue, we're introduced to the pilgrims before we get to any of their stories. The general prologue begins with an evocation of resurrected life. It is April and sweet showers help to bring new life to every wood and field. This sets the scene for the resurrected spirit of people longing to go on pilgrimage. One such group of pilgrims meets by chance at an inn in London and decide to journey together to Canterbury, telling each other stories along the way. We are then introduced to the pilgrims, who are a motley group comprised mostly of reprobates who are evidently in need of the grace that a pilgrimage brings. There is the knight a man of courage and martial prowess who joins the pilgrimage as an act of thanksgiving, having returned from the wars. There is the knight's son, the squire, who has the courage of his father in battle, but is altogether a dandy in times of peace, wearing the most fashionable clothes and hairstyle and delighting in music and dance. There is the less than holy prioress who is too prim and proper for her own good, seeking the pleasures that opulence affords. Even worse than the prim prioress is the worldly monk whose wealth makes a mockery of his vow of poverty and whose heretical theology makes a mockery of his orthodox pretensions. As if the prioress and monk were not cause enough for scandal, the friar plums new depths of depravity, committing acts of fornication and adultery, getting maidens pregnant and begging from the rich so that he can keep up his life of lechery and luxury. The roll call of reprobates continues. The shady merchant, the pleasure-seeking Franklin, the avaricious physician, the formidable and self-serving wife of Bath, the utterly uncouth miller, the dishonest manciple, the corrupt and lecherous summoner, and last and perhaps worst, the corrupt pardoner who makes a living selling fake relics to the gullible faithful. And yet in the midst of this doom and despondency, Chaucer kindles candles of sanctity to lighten our hearts and enlighten our way. There is the conscientious clerk, a student who prefers poverty and a life of learning over, to the comf over the comforts of the world. There is especially and magnificently the poor parson who exemplifies the calling of a good and holy priest, putting his hypocritical neighbours to shame and his life of simple service to the farthest flung members of his flock. And there is his, and there is his brother, the ploughman, 
who, living in peace and perfect charity, loving God above all, is the epitome of a true holy layman. And so it is that Chaucer seasons his largely objectionable menagerie of miserable sinners with a couple of saints, one representing the clergy and the other the laity, who serve as candles in the dark, shining forth sanity and sanctity in the midst of the mayhem of the madness of sin. So I would particularly recommend, if you don't read the whole of the general prologue, of the Canterbury Towers, at least read the passage uh, which is normally just titled The Poor Parson of the Town. So the part of the general prologue which is about the parson, the holy parson. And I'm not going to read it um, because it's quite long, but uh, I would recommend that you read it and there's no better place to read it than in Poems Every Catholic Should Know, which is published by Tan Books and compiled by yours truly here. Um, so it's a chronological uh, list of poems every Catholic should know, and it includes um, the extract from the general prologue on the poor parson of a town. Um, I want to talk about uh, at least one of the tales while we're at it, and my favourite probably is the nun's priest's tale. So um, this is you know the nun's priest, one of the pilgrims, a priest who's uh, travelling uh, in the service, a chaplain, if you like, for for the prioress. Um he tells a tale, and it's a, it's a fable. A uh, fable, of course, is a story uh, normally about animals, but anthropomorphic animals, in other words, animals that can talk and think. And, of course, these are normally allegories that teach moral lessons. We think of Aesop's fables, for instance. So this fable uh, is about Chanticleer the rooster and Pertolote, his favorite hen, and, and, and a fox amongst others. So Chanticleer, you know, as with roosters, if you've kept chickens and if, if, in, if you have kept chickens, you will understand this even better than you will otherwise. Um, you know, roosters are very pompous, right? Prideful. They, 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 they look after their, their flock. They look after themselves first and foremost. So he, he suffers from pride and he has seven hens, and again, right, we, we're learning, right? Our allegorical antennae are, are, are twitching. Seven hens. Well, that might not mean anything straight away, but then when we come to see what it's about, we realize the seven hens represent the seven deadly sins. So he has a, ha a harem of seven deadly sins that he surrounds himself with all the time for his personal comfort. Now, Pertolote, his favorite hen, is it signifies pride right the first and the worst of the seven deadly sins the, it's the sin that once we have that gives us permission to commit the other six right once you make yourself god and you decide who's right and wrong and 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 uh, what you want to do is up to you then you allow yourself to do the other seven deadly sins six deadly sins why why not so she represents pride and then the third character is the fox and he it's very important to, he's he's a coal fox c o l and the, the, the thing about a cold fox, it has black tips on both ears and a black tip on its tail. And as regards to caricature, that will remind us uh, of the devil, right? Horns, tail. Um, and he certainly plays the role of the devil. This fable is in some sense a representation of, um, of uh, the fall, of uh, the story of Adam and, Adam and Eve. So Chanticleer has a nightmare. And in this nightmare, he, he, he sees that he's uh, tempted to come down from his high roost by a fox. And then uh, you know, the, the, the fox uh, gets him, right? It's the nightmare. So he talks about this nightmare to Pertolote, his favorite hen, who tells him that there's a load of nonsense and he, that she's not going to admire him unless he's going to be the proud, you know, number one is not going to be scared of anything as stupid as dreams. And then there's a very long part of the fable where they talk about dreams and, and Chanticleer comes, it's, we, we've discovered that Chanticleer, this rooster is a, a great biblical scholar, uh, not just a biblical scholar, a great scholar of, of, that, of, the, of the classics and antiquity. He gives all these examples of how prophets have had dreams and how the visions in dreams have proved to be prophetic and true and how, God sends messages via dreams, and so that dreams are not things to, to be just dismissed. Whereas Pertolote, as actually she's not as eloquent, she's not very clever, 
but she's proud enough to be a philosophical materialist, <laughs> an atheist, if you like. Uh, and she, she said, oh, you know, the, the, all you need to get rid of all that nonsense is a good laxative to help you sleep, right? It's, it's, the, everything can be solved with, with physical medis- medicines, with physics uh, uh, as a physician. And, and again, uh, we have uh, Chaucer's humor here, and, it's, and, and in Latin, he says to her, because she's not very clever and she doesn't speak Latin, so she says, he says to her, in principio, mulier est hominis confusio, um, which he says to her immediately afterwards, Madam, the meaning of this Latin is woman is man's, man's whole joy and happiness. Now, of course, if you know the Latin and you know the meaning of the original words, that, that, that's very funny. Because in principio, mulio est hominis confusio is in the beginning, woman is man's confusion. <laughs> um, and I guess so this is, this is uh, obviously an allusion to Adam and Eve, okay? Uh, uh, whereas he says to her, knowing that she doesn't know Latin, uh, woman is man's whole joy and happiness. So he's being facetious. Now, when this actually happens, we're told... Uh, just, just, just below where I've just read. Now, when the month in which the world began, the month called March, when God first created man, had ended, and since its beginning, two and thirty days and nights had passed also, it chanced that Chanticleer, in all his pride, his seven wives were walking by his side, etc. What date is that? Well, first of all, that the, the date on which the world is is began, March. Now, you have to understand again the mystical calendar, and um, March the twenty fifth is the feast of the Annunciation. It's also historically seen to be the the date of the crucifixion. Historically, um, it's also therefore as obviously the Annunciation and the crucifixion are connected to the fall. That the fall is also seen to have to 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 date back to March. And that therefore we get the creation march. Now, of course, literally, that's impossible, all right? Because before there are there before the uh, the sun, uh, before the Earth is 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 is, is uh, circling the sun and rotating on its own axis, there aren't days and years and months. Um, but so obviously, this is not meant literally; it's meant literarily. Okay, so um, connecting the creation of the world with the Annunciation which did happen on a certain date, and the crucifixion, which did happen on a certain date um, after months existed. Um, So it's connecting all these things allegorically and biblically, theologically. But what is when the month in which the world began, the month called March, when God first created man, had ended, and since its beginning, two and 30 days and nights had passed also. So March has ended, but then since its beginning... 30, uh, 32 and 30 days and nights have passed also. So you go back, you back, you, you go to the end of March, then you uh, uh, um, go back to the beginning of March, March the 1st, and you, you, you count 32 days. Where are you? You're April the 1st. What is April the 1st? April Fool's Day. And April Fool's Day is an old festivity that goes back, certainly the Chaucer's time. This is another joke because this is about foolishness. What is sin? It's foolishness. Um, uh, What is the fall of Adam and Eve? It's foolishness. We talked about sanity and sanctity being synonymous or sin and madness or sin and stupidity are also synonymous. So all of this Re- representation of the story of the fall which this fable is now going to present is happening on april fool's day it's the foolishness of man or in this case the foolishness of a rooster and a hen who represent man in the fable um so um i'm going to read how the fox plays on chanticleer's pride it's it's chanticleer's pride that makes him gullible enough for the fox to fool him so, uh, where are we? It's the white page. Oh, destiny, none of us can avoid. Alas, that Chanticleer flew from those beams. Alas, his wife had no belief in dreams. So he didn't listen to the wisdom of his dream. And he came down that morning and it was a Friday. Bought this misadventure. 
Okay, so we're already connecting the, all of it to March the 25th to the crucifixion uh, and to the cause of the crucifixion, which is the fall of man. And in this case, the fall of the rooster. O oh, divine Venus, goddess of pleasure, seeing that Chanticleer was your worshipper, right? He doesn't worship uh, God, doesn't worship Christ on the cross. He worships Venus, uh, the goddess of erotic love of pleasure and served you to the utmost of his power much more that for delight than to multiply so he's not interested in in the sexual activity to have children but merely for the pleasure uh it gives how can you suffer him to die on friday of all days for it's your day so of course friday be the day of the crucifixion is a date that's connected to the goddess venus whom uh who uh trying to clear worships so here we have uh the the connection uh with with the fall and um and the crucifixion well i thought i was going to read where the fox plays on trying to clear's pride according to my notes it must be further down here but i'm not going to look for it because i can't find it fair enough um but basically what he said i could tell you what he says anyway that he he flatters uh trying to clear um, so he says, you, you sing so beautifully. Uh, I wonder if you sing as well as your father did. Uh, your father had the most beautiful voice. Uh, one day he even sang for me in my own house to my great pleasure. <laughs> in other words, when he ate him, um, uh, and then he, he persuades John to clear, look, why don't you show me how well you can sing? So what does that involve of your rooster? If you've ever watched a rooster, well, it closes it, it closes its eyes so it can't see. It stretches its neck so it's plenty to grab onto and crows. And of course, flattered by his pride, this is what Charlie Clear does to show what a beautiful voice he has. And it's while his eyes are closed and his neck is stretched, that the fox grabs him and uh, uh, f flies off with him. Um, the, the farm is thrown to chaos. They're all trying to find out what's happened to the chicken. I've been in that scenario with my, I've, we actually saved a, one of our own hens from a fox's mouth once. So that's another story. But I can, I can sympathize with the, with the chaos that, that ensues with the, the sound of the distressed rooster being carried off by the fox. But the fox has got away with it. He's going to escape. Um, but then, Chanticleer says to the fox, why don't you, you, you don't have to run now. You're already safe. You want you turn around and gloat, right? Sort of uh, because you've you've won, right? You've, so the, now the fox representing Satan uh, is seduced by pride, and of course he turns around and is going to gloat. And what's he do? He opens his jaws. Chanticleer is released from the grip and then flies up onto a tree. And again, if you look at the symbolism, flying up onto a tree is symbolic of, of the cross. So what happens? Satan is deceived by his own pride. He falls by his own pride, not once, but twice. He falls by his own pride, first of all, uh, from, 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 from heaven, but also he falls in, in sense of being foolishness for the humility of God in believing that in crucifying Christ, somehow or another, God could be de defeated. There's a wonderful analogy I'm going to resist the temptation to talk about now from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, but perhaps we'll get to that in a later episode uh, of The Authority. But the, the, this, the, this, uh, this relationship between pride and, 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 and foolishness so, and then the moral of the, every fable has to have a moral, of course. So at the end of it, um, so the, but for, let's have a look. So the, the fox says, when well, now, now Chanticleer is safe up in the tree, you know, come down and I should tell you what I meant, what I meant. And I'll speak honest truth. So help me God. <laughs> this is the devil swearing to God that he's going to tell the truth. Right. Um, uh, and uh, Chanticleer's response is, no, I'll see us both damned first um, before I <laughs> come down from this tree. But myself first and worst, both blood and bones before you trick me oftener than once. You know, once bitten, twice shy. You'll not, with your soft soap and flatteries, get me to sing again and close my eyes. Tell to him who shuts his eyes when he should look and that on purpose, the Lord send bad luck. All right, there's the first moral. 
And then we get the, uh, the final model. But if you think this tale a trumpery about a fox and a cock and hen, don't overlook the moral, gentlemen. For everything that's written, says St. Paul, is written surely to instruct us all. So take the corn and let the chaff lie still. Now, gracious Father, if it be thy will, as our Lord promised, make us all good men and bring us to his heavenly bliss. Amen. Men. So as with Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which we discussed in the last episode, it ends with a prayer that uh, God in his mercy may deliver us from sin and take us with him to heaven. Now, just to finish, the, 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 that, that this is just one of the tales. I want to focus on one of the tales. They're not all fables. Um, but uh, Chaucer chose to end with the Parsons tale, which is, which is interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, the Parsons, of course, the saint that we've been introduced to uh, in the um, in the general prologue that we talked about. Uh, it, it Chaucer ends with with the saint having the last words. And what's interesting, it's not a story. It's not a tale. The the Parsons not interesting in telling another story. The parson is interested in giving. Uh, it's a sermon on the seven deadly sins and the necessity of penitence. And basically, all the stories, in some sense, are woven on the theme of sin and the consequences of sin and the, the necessity of, of repentance. Uh, but the parson's tale ties it all together. And although you know, the work's unfinished, but we know that it was Chaucer's intention that it would conclude with this sermon on the seven deadly sins by the, the, the saint in the company of the pilgrims the parson and although it was meant to come last he seems to have written it first or towards the beginning so it was always his intention throughout the whole, whole thing that it would end basically with a straightforward prosaic non-fictional story just a sermon a treatise on the seven deadly sins and the necessity of penitence and then um we're going to end with chaucer's retractions before he died his own act of of a penance if you like um which shows what a holy man he was, at least at his death, irrespective of anything else. So um, these are his words, uh, slightly uh, uh, modernized, thankfully, because it would be difficult for me to read and difficult for you to understand otherwise. Now I pray all those who hear or read this little treatise, if there be anything in it which pleases them, to thank our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom proceeds all wisdom and all goodness. And if there be anything that displeases them, then I pray them to ascribe the fault to my incompetence and not my will, for I would gladly have spoken better had I the ability. As the Bible says, all that is written is written for our instruction, and that has been my aim. And so I meekly beseech you, for God's mercy, that you pray for me, that Christ have mercy upon me and forgive me my trespasses, in particular my translations and my authorship of works of worldly vanity, which I revoke in my retractions. Troilus and Cressida, the House of Fame, the Legend of Good Women, the Book of the Duchess, the Parliament of Fowls, those are the Canterbury Towers that conduce to sin, the Book of the Lion, and many other books, if I could remember them, and many a song and a chivious lay, for which Christ in his great mercy forgive me this sin. But for the translations of the Consolation of Boethius, and other books of legends of the saints, and works of morality and devotion, for these I thank our Lord Jesus Christ and his blessed mother, and all the saints of heaven, entreating them that they should send me grace to lament my sins, and attend to my soul's salvation from henceforth till the day I die, and grant me the grace of true penitence, confession, and penance in this present life, through the merciful grace of him who is king of kings and priest over all priests, who redeemed us with the precious blood of his heart, that I may be one of those who shall be saved on the day of doom. Qui cum patriot spiritu sancto vivit et regnat Deus per omnia secular. Amen. Those are the words of a saint. 
at least at the time. He wrote those in true spirit of, of, of contrition and humility. And I can't think of any better w- way of ending this episode of um, of the authority except with that wonderful prayer from this wonderful poet, one of the greatest in the English language, Geoffrey Chaucer. And we can actually move from someone who's certainly trying to be a saint uh, in Geoffrey Chaucer in the next episode to someone who has been canonized as a saint. In the next episode of The Authority, we will look at the work, the poetry of uh, the great Jesuit martyr from the time of Shakespeare, St. Robert Southall. And until then, thanks so much for joining me in The Authority, and goodbye and God bless. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, Visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc, as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, Check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.